We have our guest feature, Andrea Lovett, with us. Um, born in, and raised in the area of Vermont and then in uh, South Weymouth. Uh, Andrea was born telling stories, or so it seemed, a natural progression for her and what was next. She began uh, to professionally tell stories in 1992, and it has taken her to many interesting places. As a writer, she is now working on a book uh, with a, the J.O. Callahan Writers Group, hoping to come out in the spring. And Andrea also has been busy teaching as well as telling, and she works with students of different ages within the schools. And I, I liked this quote and small bit of story so much I'd like to share with you about her work. I've been told that Andrea is very hilarious, but I also hear uh, the power of this story. I was teaching in a Boston high school in a class the teacher had said, everyone, oh Lord, <laughs> I will have to begin again. I was teaching in a Boston high school in a class the teacher had said everyone was so shy they would never share their stories on paper, let alone tell them out loud. I was there for three days and I witnessed a transformation. Every single student had a story they needed and wanted to tell. One by one, they came up to share a moment in their lives in a three-minute story. For me, it was like listening to a well-loved book. When my visits were done, this now talkative class had listened to each other's life experiences and had become a more than a class. The students had become a community with a deeper understanding and respect for each other. This has nothing to do with me and everything to do with the power of telling your own story. Andrea honors others' stories as co-founder of Mass Mouth in Boston. She tells stories herself, locally and internationally over in Europe. We're delighted that she is here on her path of travels today in Hopkinton to share some of her stories of travel wherever she may go and lead us. So please help me give a warm welcome to Andrea Lovett. These are um, stories today I'm going to tell from my life. I tell all kinds of stories, and as she mentioned, I do teach. Uh, the first group of stories is a, um, very tiny little vignettes. And if you've ever been in a long relationship, you know that at the beginning of that relationship, there's a period of time where you can say and do things that later on in that relationship would never fly. <laughs> that period of time is called the honeymoon period. I'd like to share with you, too, from a trilogy of stories from my honeymoon period. And I won't tell you the first one. I'll just tell you that something happened that I can't tell here because this is a PG <laughs> studio today. But I will tell you, to make it up to my husband, I told him I would make anything he wanted for dinner. Now, we were newly married, maybe two or three weeks, and he said to me, great, I like Swedish meatballs. Swedish meatballs. Swedish meatballs. Can you make them? Of course I can make them. We were both Irish-American. I never made Irish, uh, Swedish meatballs. I've made Irish meatballs, never Swedish meatballs. And I said, I'll be right back. I went into the bedroom, and I reached for the hotline under the bed, and I called my mother. Ma, how do you make Swedish meatballs? Oh, she said, it's easy. You take Hamburg and some sage. Sage? Well, I knew about sage. My sister had grown an herb garden, and she had pulled out a whole plant and handed me sage the day before. Sage I could use. So I, the next night, I came home, and I put all the ingredients together. I made the meatballs, I worked in the sage plant, and I got the brown goop. I put on the uh, parsley on top and the noodles, and I presented it to him, and I said, Swedish meatballs. And he looked at me, and he took a bite, and then he took another bite, and he had this look on his face, 
And now I asked him something that I know better not to ask these days. I've been married a long time. But I, I had to know. I said, is something wrong? <laughs> and he looked at me. And now he knows better. We've been married a long time. He knows never to say these things because he's better off to just eat your meatballs. He said, do you want the truth? <laughs> Well, I guess. And he said to me, it tastes like Christmas trees. I said, what? <laughs> well, I tried mine. It was fine. And so I tried a little bit of his, and it did taste vaguely like a blue spruce. <laughs> and I tried a little bit more, and out fell the entire sage plant. See, no one had told me to take off the little leaves and put them in. I worked in the whole meatball and it ended right, landed right in his meatball, the whole plant. <laughs> to make it up to him, I was doing the laundry the next day at my mother's house and I piled it high and went down the three flights of stairs to the street across, and when I opened the door, we lived in a third floor walk up in Dorchester, and on my neighbor's sidewalk, there, like a beacon from heaven, was a washing machine. And on it, in black and white letters, it said, still works. If I could have that washing machine, I could be the domestic goddess he thinks I am. So I called him up and I said, there's a washing machine that we should have and hook it up in our house and we could have all our laundry done right in the place we live. So he and his brother came, I convinced them, and they began to hoist it up the three flights of stairs. About halfway up, a black snake of oil began to drip down the stairs. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, now, I don't know why, to this day, he thinks I know the answers to life's burning questions. <laughs> why, why is the machine leaking oil? And I said, all machines leak oil when you tip them on the side. It's perfectly fine. Bring it up the stairs. So we brought it up the stairs. We called my father-in-law, who's known as somewhat of a handyman. He plugged it in, he brought his hammer, he tapped on the outside, a little on the inside, and he said, get a light wash. Well, I grabbed all the underwear in the house, both clean and dirty, put it into the washing machine. We pulled up two chairs, and we sat there, and I looked at him, and I said, this is living. <laughs> and the water began to fill up in the tub, and I said, this is life. <laughs> and we looked at each other, and the washing machine was about to kick into the washing cycle. And I said, we're rich. And at that moment, the washing cycle kicked in, and all that water that we listened to fill up in the washing machine <laughs> began to leak out like Niagara Falls all over the kitchen floor. I said, quick, turn it off. I'll rescue the underwear. I went in. I wrung all the underwear and I placed it strategically all over the house. And I looked at him and I said, there's nothing more we can do. Let's go to bed. The next morning, he woke up early. He always wakes up a lot earlier than I do, around 5 o'clock in the morning. It was dark. And he went in the shower. He came back out. And he said to me, the underwear is wet. I can't wear it. And I said, well, slap a pair on. We're going to be late for work. And he got down right into my face as if I wasn't understanding the full meaning of this problem he had. He said, I can't wear it this way. Again, he thinks I know the answers to life's burning questions. I'll take care of it. Now, somewhere in the back of my mind, you know those nuggets of wisdom that your mother hands down to you? And I remembered her saying once, in case of emergency, you can always dry underwear in the oven. <laughs> well, this did seem like somewhat of an emergency. So I turned it on grill, placed the underwear in, and took a shower. When I came out, there was steam and smoke coming from the door. I pulled it open blew away the steam and smoke, and there was my 
husband's underpants, perfectly dry. It worked. I pulled them and it tugged a little bit. And when I pulled them off, it had three grill marks in the back of the underpants. It was still dark. I could strategically hand them to him and he would not know a thing, which he didn't. He went to work, we came home, I pulled out the pots and pans to get dinner ready, and he appeared in the kitchen doorway with a small swatch of cloth with three grill marks in his palm. Note to self, men's underwear is not quite as strong as they say on TV. And he looked at me and he said, Andrea, never grill my underpants again. <laughs> and I never did. However, I have dyed the odd lot pink and hot glued a few rips and tears, but never have I grilled his underpants again. <laughs> so that, that is a true story, but I, I'm going to share with you a little something. I have a passion. I have a passion for maps. Now, everybody's going to be getting, going to visiting holiday guests and, and family and people using their GPS. I have a passion for maps. And I'll tell you how that happened. When I was a little girl, I used to follow my mother around the house when she was cleaning. And in my brother's room, there was a map the size of a small Volkswagen. And she used to point out different places on this map. And she'd tell me a little bit about it. And I thought, wow, to go to those places. And I couldn't go, but my paper dolls could. And I used to thumbtack them on the countries, Barbie in France, Barbie in British Columbia, Barbie in Indonesia. And as I got a little older, when I was about seven or eight, my friends were asking for a Barbie sports car. I asked for a globe, and I got it. It was a metal globe, and I could see all the countries all at once. I even found the island of Ogo. The tea got lost in the seam of the map. <laughs> and as I grew a little older, I discovered road maps, and I drove my parents crazy because I would look at the road map, and I'd say, Next town, Everett. <laughs> Next town, Somerville. And they'd say, we don't need to know every town. But I did. Next town, Chelsea. <laughs> and then as I got older, I discovered Google Maps. Now, Google Maps was really fun because they give you a time. It was like a game. I used to try to beat the Google Maps. To this day, I try to beat the Google Maps. 52 minutes. I can get that in 49. <laughs> So telling you this, you can imagine my disappointment when one Christmas my husband handed me a small package and I opened it up and it said GPS, Global Positioning System. I like maps. And he said, it's for you so you won't get lost going to your storytelling gigs. I don't get lost. He gets lost. I don't get lost. He said. Let's get it going. We'll put it in the car. So I went out and I put it in the car. Let's go to the Stop and Shop. The Stop and Shop is around the corner. I know where the Stop and Shop is. Yeah, but maybe it doesn't. So we get in, and my two kids drive, and they get in the back, and we're going down the street. And all of a sudden, we hear, in 500 feet, turn right. <gasps> She's British. Oh, this is so exciting. Let's name her. We named her Agnes, Agnes Garman. And it was insidious how it happened. I began to like her. And I used to tell her stories. And I know she liked them because I could tell in her voice, in 500 feet, turn right. In 500 feet, turn left. And she had this little bounce to her story, you know, if she liked my stories. And sometimes I felt she was disappointed, so I had to work on it. And then one week, as I was going somewhere, she said, in 500 feet, turn right, right. And then a couple weeks later, in 300 feet, turn left, left, right. 
Agnes had developed a speech impediment. <laughs> but I didn't want to tell her, so I, I ignored it. And then she started leaving out little phrases. In five fun, and I. But we had grown accustomed to each other. And here's the thing, I forgot to notice landmarks and, and things that I had grown up practicing where I was from. I forgot to notice maps. I just listened to Agnes and I had a storytelling program down in Taunton which is not familiar to me at all. And when I came out of the venue, I got in the car and I'm driving up and Agnes said, in 500 feet. <laughs> I tried to resuscitate her, but nothing happened, and I called my husband. Now, my husband is not good in emergency, and I don't know why I forget this every time I have an emergency, but I call him up and I say, oh, Charlie, Agnes is dead. <laughs> did you try to resuscitate her? Yes, I did. What am I going to do? I don't know. What the hell you want me to do? <laughs> nothing, and I hang up, and I'm thinking, I don't know where I am, and I waited. And then I remembered, I had a map book in the back of my car. And I remembered what the street name was, and I opened it up. And I found not one, not two, not three, but five ways home. And I could beat Google Maps, and I knew it. And I drove home, and I handed my husband Agnes, and I said, she's gone. <laughs> and I was secretly kind of happy. And he was so upset, and I said, it's okay. We're going in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> and we did. And to this day, I don't have a GPS, but I'm thinking about, I heard an, a very sexy Australian man, and I might get him. <laughs> <laughs> and my last story is, because it's Thanksgiving, I thought I would share this story. This is absolutely true. Growing up, my father was the type of man that was very um, straight-laced. He liked things in the box. Everything had a place, and everything should be in its place. And my mother, well, my mother was his polar opposite. Chaos danced around her like a party dress. She was very fun to be with. But one thing that they shared was their love of the holidays and people. And every holiday, my mother would invite all sorts of people. We never knew who was going to be at our Thanksgiving dinner. I remember one Thanksgiving, I sat across from the mailman and my mother's hairdresser, and we had 27 people. But what they didn't know was before they had dinner, on the day before, in the morning, my mother did not have a turkey. You see, she was generous with her pocket, but a little frugal. With her, she was generous with her love, but a little frugal with her pocket. That's what she was. And she was looking through the newspaper, and her eyes glazed over, and she said, There it is. We're going here. The butcher block had just opened in the north end of Boston. Big birds cheap. Get in the car. So we got in the car. We drove into Boston, and the parking lot was completely full. And there was a line coming out the door. So we had to park up on a little incline, just a little bit of distance away. And we walked down, and we were standing in line, and she's looking through elbows, and she's looking over shoulders for that sign that said, Big Bird's Cheap. And I knew she had seen it, because she had this look in her eye. And when the traffic cleared, she made a beeline for that bin. And she called over her shoulder, Hold my waist. I'm going in. <laughs> I said, What? Hold my waist. I'm going in. Going to get the best one. Now, my mother was not a big woman. She was very tiny, and I held on to her waist. And before I knew it, her feet were off the ground, and she was in the bin. And then she called over my, her shoulder, pull me up. I've got one. <laughs> I said, what? Pull me up. I've got one. Attached to her hand was the biggest bird I've ever seen. It was the size of a small cow. And it took two of us to pull it out of the bin, drag it over to the conveyor belt, and put it on. There was a man dressed in white 
jacket, long, with smudges all over his jacket, a scully cap. And back then, you could smoke in food stores, and he had a little snub-nosed cigar. And the turkey was coming up the conveyor belt, and he said, that's a big bird, lady. And he starts slapping it, cigar ashes going all over the bird. Big bird! And my mother gave him a cold stare. She was not the sort of woman that liked cigar ash seasoning on her Thanksgiving turkey. He said, you know what? I'm going to double bag it for you. So he took two plastic bags, put the turkey in, handed my mother one side and myself the other side, and we started to go up the street. And as we're talking back and forth, something shifted in the bag. And we both caught each other's eye in time to see the bag break and the turkey escaping down the sidewalk, neck over tail, neck over tail, neck over tail, <laughs> all the way down, where it teetered a little bit on the sidewalk and sloughed over. My mother's face was as white as a ghost, and she ran down, and she examined the bird this way, then that way, and there were dirt grits and sand and rocks embedded in the skin. And she looked at me and she said, it's still good, get it in the car. <laughs> so we got it in the car and we were driving home and there were words in my house that we always spoke like a mantra. Now, don't tell your father. <laughs> And we didn't, because my father was not the sort of man that would like to know that his turkey had rolled down the sidewalk and ended in the gutter. When we got home, we placed the turkey on the table, and we went into the living room to just sit for a while. We were exhausted when we heard, and we ran out in time to see the turkey come off the table and the dog and cat arguing over the leg of the bird. My mother quickly scooped it up, put it in the sink, got a needle and thread, and reattached the leg to the bird. <laughs> All afternoon, we spent taking sand and dirt grits out of the bird. And the next morning, she got up really early and placed it in the oven, ready to go. Around 10 o'clock, we had something that happened in our house every day, because my mother was that type of cook. It was the only thing that my father did not get upset about. <laughs> Meh, meh, the fire alarm. Everything all right in there, Louise? Everything's fine. She pulled open the door of the oven, and the turkey was covered in a thick gray soot. She pulled it out, put it in the oven, looked at me and said, don't tell your father. She reached up. My mother was a genius in the kitchen. She reached up and got the food coloring. She mixed some orange and yellow to make a gold. <laughs> And then she, she got my praying paint brush, you, you know, the ones that the little paint kits. Well, she took the paint brush out, washed it off, and began to paint the entire turkey with orange and yellow food coloring. She put it in the oven. A few hours later, it came out. It was gorgeous. A beautiful golden bird. My father began to carve the bird, and he ate, everyone ate, and it was delicious. And he said, geez Louise, that was the best damn bird we ever had. Did you do anything different? <laughs> and I thought, well, how do you write a recipe like that? Thank you very much. This is called A Marriage. When the shape of the dream changed, was that the betrayal? When you turned away, was it for a solitary life? When questions were asked, silence answered. A memory of when your body moved in me. You stood in the doorway, already gone, tired phantom of something that had been before, long past forgiveness. No evidence scar when the heart is broken. Loss does not go away. It goes deeper. Years of winter lie ahead. I read until the light is gone. Room so cold, the empty bed. Halloween was canceled today. Can they do that? <laughs> Mom said it's not canceled, just postponed. I don't see the difference. Halloween is Halloween, right? They never postpone Monday. 
I remember a while back we changed the clocks. That really scared me. Isn't it really five o'clock at five o'clock? Can we just make up what time it is? I'm going to remember that when it's time to get up to catch the bus. I tried to take a phone message the other day. After tell your dad, I pretty much lost my way. <laughs> Something about apartments, I think. Do they really believe I can understand this stuff? Dad says it's a safety issue, but I don't know. My friend Brett fell through the jungle gym last week. Miss Porter said he looked like a doll stuck in a blender. He cried a little, but then he was fine. Kids are tougher than they look. And what do the ghosts think? Sorry, bad weather, go back to your grave. I just came from a grave, how bad can the weather be? I have clean hair and a clean face. I brush my teeth, usually. My grandmother thought it was adorable when I said, excuse me, Graham, may I have another cookie? I let my little brother be Batman this year, even though I called it months ago. We should just have Halloween on Halloween. Mom wondered what everyone's gonna do with all that candy, me too. <laughs> but it's okay to have candy anytime, right? Right? Thank you. Just one.